Oh, hi. My name is Sean uh, Daniel, and um, I'm uh, from North Carolina State University. I'm here working with energy harvesting with mechanical vibration, and I'm in a summer SROP program. I'm working with Dr. Amin Karami and Dr. Daniel Inman of Aerospace Engineering, and they're in University of Michigan. Okay, so an introduction in history to this um, electromagnetic transduction. Danish scientist Hans Oersted discovered that electric currents create magnetic fields in 1820. A British scientist named William Sturgeon invented the electromagnet in 1824. It was discovered that electricity and magnetism were coupled in nature. This means that electricity can generate magnetism and magnetism can generate electricity. When a current goes through a wire, a magnetic field circles the wire in the, the format you see with the right hand rule, thumb up along the direction of the current and the fingers curling show the direction of the magnetic field that's going around like a hula hoop. When the wire is wrapped into a solenoid, you see the hula hoop-like circulations down here. The, the bigger, the, when you go farther out, the radius is they intersect and they, they kind of form like a number figure eight. They kind of straighten out. They don't go around the loop wire anymore. So eventually, when they hit the center, they go straight through, like a current through a pipe. So this is, when you, when you have a current through, you generate like a magnetic field like this, but when you send a magnetic flux density like this filter here, you add a magnet close to the coil, you generate electricity. So you can go either way for, yeah. Electromagnetic induction through solenoid equation. I you, there's a single, single layer air coil and a multi-layer air coil. A single layer air coil means that you have a solenoid but you have no ferrous core in the middle, meaning, meaning that there's, the, there's no, no permeability at all. The equation is the magnet constant u mu naught times n squared times area over l, which is the length of the solenoid co core. And then the, the multi-layer version is r squared equals, is, this is the mean radius. So it's the radius because it's varying areas because it's the overlap of the coils you know, going around and around, like kind of like a wrap of, a wrap of duct tape. It's, it's a mean, the, but the mean area. It's n squared, this is r, the mean, the mean radius, the l, length of the, of the Solenoid core and D, which is the depth of the core. And I use Fortran in order to optimize the the cross-sectional area of the solenoid in order so you can have the maximum amount of turns around the solenoid, and and so solenoid can act, get the most amount of flux from the magnet that's going around it. So I, for Fortran and for, sim, for simplicity, I use this equation in order to get the optimum cross-sectional area. And at the end, once I got the good ideal area that I wanted, then once I knew the amount of turns I needed, and I knew the basic core that I was going to be dealing with, the cross-sectional area, I used a program in order to find the, the true inductance for a varying area solenoid core. But I'll show you that in the, in the next slide. You'll see the other drawings and the equations. The abstract. We seek to harvest electrical energy with mechanical vibrations, and the technique we use to convert mechanical to electrical energy is electromagnetic induction. This technique of energy harvesting can be used on machines, bridges, tunnels, animals, or people. This energy harvesting, energy harvesting method can be used in almost any environment, outer space, land, air, or sea. When using mechanical vibrations, the energy generated depends heavily on the frequency of excitation. We'll use an oscilloscope to measure the pendulum displacement and velocity. The electrical energy produced depends on the pendulum velocity and the displacement. We'll also con connect our generator to the resistors to measure the energy dissipated, thus measuring the power output. So we're not collecting the energy, you know, the power or anything, we're just measuring the dissipation to see the output we get based on our uh, generator design. So with mechanical vibrations, you have th four degrees of freedom, x axis, y axis, z axis, and a rotational axis. For example, if you're putting this generator on a car and letting it spin, if the car is going, let's say, 60 miles per hour, you have a huge amount of RPMs, and that's going to ha generate a lots of energy, which is the most effective way of using mechanical vibrations to generate energy. You, also, you, you can also use piezoelectric induction. So it's electromagnetic induction, a uh, uh, magnet, solenoid coil, and then it's piezoelectric induction. This method is also widely used for mechanical vibration. Dr. Yao Wen Yang of the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Nanyang Technical Technological University in Singapore, his research involves using mechanical vibrations to detect structural damage in civil structures like bridges. So basically, let's say you have an I-beam, steel. You have piezoelectric patches patched all along the steel, and you cover this I-beam with concrete. 
When a car drives over a bridge, the bridge oscillates at a certain frequency. For all these patches, it oscillates at the exact same frequency. The displacement you get in the bridge oscillation is the exact same displacement the piezoelectric patch will bend. And when a piezoelectric patch bends, it generates electricity. This electricity goes to a sensor, and the sensor reads the electricity generated from this piezoelectric patch. So if there's, the bridge is oscillating five oscillations per second, the piezoelectric patch will generate spikes of electricity at five spikes per second. So you know that your bridge is, is, is stable, it's constant, there's no damage to the structure. When there's a crack, a surface crack on the bridge, or an internal crack, or even a small hole with a diameter of, let's say, a centimeter, the change in oscillation of the bridge is significant. What this means is, these patches right here that are way far out, these, even these patches here can sense the change in the oscillation. The ones that are closest to the damage give the most change in oscillation, and that's when you know that there's damage. This technique of structural monitoring can be used for airplane wings, for ship hulls, for tunnels, let's say there's underground tunnels that hold petroleum, they can be lined all around tunnels, under, under, underwater tunnels, tunnels that allow cars to go under the water and travel across islands. It, it, these can be used for many different applications. This generator right here, which is just basically like a clock face that holds a, a pendulum that goes around solenoids, this basic design is used in, let's say, see this bear? There's a collar on this bear, and this bear has a generator inside its collar. When he bends down to get something to eat, or hunt, or fish, or something, that electricity is generated, and that electricity goes to sensors that tell you where the bear is at all times. So you can follow where a bear is somewhere in North America, find out where a herd of lions are, or a herd of deer, that kind of stuff. Or even for someone who's, let's say, on house arrest. This, this kind of technology can be used for location of people or for location of damage on a structure, or if there is damage on a structure. Here is a video done by my um, mentor, Dr. Amin Karami, under Dr. Daniel Inman. And you see here, here's a, a piezoelectric patch, and here's a mass on the end. And it, there's a laser right here which gives you displacement, and you know basically which regime of vibration you're in. So here we're generating energy and we're measuring the, the vibration and with the vibration in, well yeah, you can see. So it's vibrating and the computer gives you the displacement of the, of the pendulum showing you how the, the piezoelectric patch is bending. Same thing for bridges. If you were to put it on a bridge, the oscillation, the piezoelectric patch is going to show you how you are generating electricity, whereas it's generating electricity in a sinusoidal wave or a random, random wave like we see here. See the randomness, and here's a limit cycle oscillation graph, and here's a displacement graph with respect to time. Limit, os limit cycle oscillation, this is like, for example, a, like sine x plus sine 2x. This is period doubling, but this is in the nonlinear regime, and this, this is a good transition to chaotic motion. So from linear, the linear motion goes to, to something like limit cycle oscillation, and eventually it goes to chaotic motion. So, yeah, there's many different types of oscillations, not just linear, there's nonlinear, there's two different types of nonlinear we're dealing with, limit cycle and chaotic, so, yep. So what I did this summer? I used Fortran to test a range of solenoid cross-sectional errors to allow maximum amount of wire turns on our solenoid. With the guidance from, from my mentor, I designed a customized solenoid and the shape of the solenoid core was also customized. This maximized the amount of turns we could have. So basically, having a square in a cylindrical container versus having a circle in a cylindrical container. The circle is obviously going to allow you to have the most amount of wire, even if they are the same area. So, you know, when the coils wrap around, eventually they'll overlap, 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 and they'll hit the edge of the container, you want to hit the edge of the container, you know, well, yeah. We also use Fortran to find the minimum amount of solenoid turns that would satisfy the impedance condition. So here we see, this is R internal, less than one half R optimal. R optimal is resistance that has to do with impedance matching condition. So R optimal equals omega times L, which is angular velocity times the inductance. Okay, R optimal also equals the res internal resistance plus the load resistance. The load resistance is like a resistor or a light bulb. The, the internal resistance is the internal resistance of the wire, the, the, the wire that's going around the solenoid coil. So this is the length of the wire. So this is like 2 pi r times n, which is the number of times you're overlapping, times the internal resistance per unit length, which is given on a website where you're going to buy your magnet wire. This is, this is omega, on the angular velocity, 6,000 pi, 6,000 pi, and here's one half in 
magnet constant n squared times pi r squared over L, the length of our cylinder coil, for this instance is 0 0.0077 meters, which I'll just explain how I found that later. But basically, R optimal must be bigger than R internal at all times. We see this one half right here shortens R, R optimal. So, we, so basically, yeah, R optimal has to get bigger than R internal. But right now, it's R, in the beginning stages, R optimal is less than R internal, which means you will not have inductance. So if you're at a low RPM, let's say 6,000 pi, like 2 pi, you will not have in inductance. The bigger your velocity, in your velocity, like if say you're putting on the car, a car tire, then you would have inductance. Here, we found that we solve for n, and this is the n, this gives the value, when n equals this, this gives the value of the minimum amount of, sol of coil turns that allows for this impedance matching condition. So if n is less, then the optimal resistance will be less than internal resistance. As you can see here, this n right here, this is n squared. This increases exponentially, this increases linearly. What that means is, the more amount of wire turns you have, the more inductance you'll have, and that'll outdo the internal resistance you have. But this, so it sounds simple, right? Uh, let's see. Wrong. Basically, what I found out is that the, your wire diameter get, determines your internal resistance. Here, for AWG28 and AWG30, there's a wire diameter you know, 0 0.014 inches, 0 0.012 inches, and you have a list of values. The values of the, the radius of the cross-sectional area solenoid, the area of the cross-sectional area of the solenoid, the minimum n value in order to allow for impedance matching condition, depending on the, the size of the area, the wire length for the minimum impedance matching condition, the transduction constant, R internal, which depends on the length of your, of your wire, the inductance and the maximum and allowable. So basically, our solenoid has a you know like out turn spool. You don't want to you don't want to overlap the out turn spool. So that, that basically, depending on how big this internal solenoid core area is, it lets you know how much how big your wire overlap can expand. So this gives you your maximum and allowable. As you can see, for the impedance matching condition, all of the wire lengths for the minimum n, all the wire lengths are equal. So are all the transduction constants and so are all the internal inductances. What that means, so, well yeah, so what that means is it's all the same amount of wire length, so yeah, so basically, here's the kicker. As you see here, we have internal resistance for impedance matching condition for the minimum amount of, of solenoid, of wire turns you can have around the solenoid core, you have 0.5 ohms. Here, for AWG30, you have 1.5 ohms. This is three times as big as this. For, so, for wire diameter, the difference in the wire diameter is this 0 0.002 inches. You have three times internal res um, resistance. This is just for the minimum and allowable. If you were to add like 700, 700 turns, 1,000, 700 turns versus 1,000 turns, that number would be significantly bigger. Probably around, it would be around 10, 10 ohms here and about like 5 ohms here if you were to go to the maximum and allowable. But, um, so, but that's not too, that's not too, that's not too bad. So, but basically, my, there's, uh, my, my online supplier sells you five wire gauges from AWG28 to AW, AWG36, only the even numbers, so 28, 30, 32, 34, 36. AWG36 has a wire diameter of 0 .006 inches. When I put this in the Fortran program, I found that the internal resistance for the minimum impedance matching condition was from 13 to 15 ohms internal resistance. You know what that means? That means that you have uh, like a thousand and allowable, you would have internal resistance. Of, it would be huge. The, 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 min, in, the minimum and allowable would barely even get you, would barely even get you to match the impedance condition. It wouldn't match. So basically, if you would have a huge internal resistance, like it was like a huge internal resistance, if it's, if it's too big, you would have to have a huge amount of RPMs in order to, for the, the R optimal, that's the equation, in order for R optimal to, to be bigger than this side, you would have to have a huge amount of RPMs. And for application of our mechanical vibration, we're just focusing on like having a, a generator on like a human being or like on an animal. So that's about 50 RPMs versus a huge amount, like 500 RPMs. So basically, the nature of your oscillation basically determines the, how you're going to design your wire thickness and how you're going to design your solenoid size. Mm. All right. Another thing I designed was the length of the solenoid the length of the solenoid core. Basically, with this equation, 
This is finding the magnetic flux at a distance from this magnet. The flux density at oh, sorry. The flux density at a distance equals this all the stuff right here. This is the flux density at the surface of the magnet, which is the maximum. Here's the magnet. The surface of the magnet has the maximum amount of flux density. The farther away you go, is like an exponentially decrease in magnetic flux density. Okay, so the fine I basically found the x that allows you to have the magnet flux density at a distance to be one tenth of the magnetic flux of the surface. This is the task that my mentor bestowed upon me, and I found it to be 0 0.0077 meters or 7.7 .7 millimeters long. So that's how long my solenoid core is to allow to fit in this it, in order to solve this problem. And so yeah, that's also something I did for the summer. So, the conclusion is this. Energy harvesting with mechanical vibrations has its limitations. It generates energy in the order of microwatts, whereas wind turbines and water turbines generate energy in the order of kilowatts. So vibrational energy generation can't power a city grid, but it can power small electronics that measure structural integrity of systems or location of animals and people. Unlike wind and water turbines, vibrational energy harvesting does not need a source of strong current of wind or water to make electricity. And the gadgets powered can send signals miles back to a wireless receiver that measures the sensor's output, like with the bridge discussed earlier in this presentation. I found out that energy harvesting with mechanical vibrations can have a huge application to many engineering industries. Airplane wing vibration due to atmospheric turbulence, holes of ships and water, underground petroleum tunnels, and more. With this energy harvesting method, people can increase their insight in scientific creativity. So, my name is Sean Daniel. It's a pleasure to work here in University of Michigan for SROP. I'd like to thank um, the people that helped me get here and um, my professors, my mentors, Dr. Krami, Dr. Inman, and the people that allowed me to be here and learn the stuff. So thank you and have a very nice day.